Climate change is going to be a big issue in the 2021 Canadian election, and all of the parties now have uh, plans. And the but a lot of the focus is on the CPC, the Conservative Party plan, because the other three are considered credible uh, by economists and, and other analysts. And the CPC plan in 2019 was not. So is the 2021 version of it an upgrade? Is it credible? Uh, we're asking experts, and I'm going to be talking to Professor Catherine Harris who is in the political science faculty at UBC. So welcome to the interview, Catherine. Thank you, it's Harrison. Sorry. Catherine, what is the, uh, uh, what's your take on, on the CPC plan? Um, it is definitely a big improvement from the 2019 plan, which really had almost no credibility. Um, the, it accepts carbon pricing for industry, um, include some smart regulations, and there is a path that would be credible to achieve a 30% reduction below 2005 by 2030. Um, but I think there are also some important loopholes in the plan that may well undermine that, that haven't been, uh, hadn't, didn't, weren't modeled and haven't received the same attention. Yeah, well, let's talk about that a little bit. Uh, Professor uh, Jennifer Winters at the University of Calgary, who's an economist, was fairly critical of the CPC plan because she pointed out things like tying the, uh, the Canadian uh, industrial emitter carbon price, uh, which is a, it's a tax, to the American carbon price, which is a cap and trade, the two different systems. She says they just aren't compatible. You can't you can't do that. And it seems like the more economists start to dig into the details of this plan. So my question to you as a political scientist is, you know, is some of this smoke and mirrors designed to give the appearance of a credible plan in, during an election campaign where you're probably not going to really get called on it? I think that could be. Um, I think when the plan came out in the spring, there was a lot of good press that the conservatives were accepting carbon pricing and the comment in the plan that said they were prepared to match the liberal schedule for large industrial emitters going to $170 per ton of CO2 in 2030. But there are those caveats in there that it would that matching that price schedule would be conditional on the EU and the US having similar pricing. And that, that is by no means a given. Um, in the EU case, it's partly that they started much sooner. And so they don't face the same challenge in driving down their emissions as we do, because we let our emissions go up by 20% before we started reducing them. Um, so it's not clear that they'll need to get to $170 per ton to meet their target. In the US case, I think it's very unlikely that we will see national carbon pricing, whether carbon tax or emissions trading in the US, um, given the, the complications of getting legislation through Congress, um, they're likely to rely on spending paid for by increasing taxes. Well, this raises an interesting, uh, it's an example of what I mean by smoke and mirrors. So most Canadians don't know that industrial emitters actually get a healthy discount off the uh, off the carbon price because it's called in uh, um, output based allocation system. So in the idea is so that you uh, companies in Canada that are paying the carbon pricing aren't Uncom rendered uncompetitive against their American or other competitors. So like it, most of them get 80 to 90% discount. They, you know, at $50 a ton, they aren't paying $50 a ton. They're paying $5 a ton or, you know, $2 a ton. And I mean, they're paying very low prices. So even if you raise it up to 70, uh, $170 by 2030, you still have the ability to control your uh, exposure of energy intense trade exposed businesses to do that but you, by by controlling the discount right and so and this I whole the, yeah, the so other I, thing I'll just wrap this up the whole business of tying it to some another what another country you do is just totally irrelevant because you control the discount canada controls the discount absolutely protection for competitiveness is built into the design of the the current carbon pricing scheme for industry so that's not needed in that sense. But the, the other aspect of that I think that's misunderstood is that the NDP platform has been saying that the Liberals have exempted emissions from industry. Um, and I think that can be misleading too because the fact that they only pay above a certain amount means they still have that price incentive to reduce 
it's kind of the equivalent of giving back money to households through tax cuts. So they still have incentives. Um, it's like getting free permits in an emissions trading scheme. Yeah, very good point. Now, what about some of these consumer uh, proposals like the uh, low carbon savings account? Uh, what do you make of that? I think it's a gimmick. Um, it, uh, you know, there's two parts to it. The first is that the price would be lower. It would um, go back to $20 per ton at the pump and only rise as high as $50 per ton. We'll be at $50 per ton already in 2022 under the current price schedule and go up to 170. So the incentives to drive less and purchase a new vehicle will be much weaker. But the other aspect of it is the, the savings plan aspect, which will weaken the incentives because if I know that every time I fuel my gas guzzler, I'm going to get all that money back and the kids need new bikes anyway, um, then it's not providing an incentive for me to reduce my fuel consumption because, hey, I'm planning to spend that money anyway. Whereas under the liberal strategy in the provinces subject to the federal carbon tax, people get the money back um, equal amounts per family regardless of how much they paid. So it doesn't weaken the price signal in the way that the, the savings plan does. I also worry about how long it's going to take to set that up and the amount of private information that will need to be saved somewhere about people's um, spending habits. And the bureaucracy of, uh, you go from a very simple system, which we have now, uh, in, particularly in BC, to a very more, a much more complex and bureaucratic system that's going to take a lot of resources. Now, my final question here, Catherine, and this is really one of my big concerns about, or questions anyway, about this campaign, uh, this platform, is that the, the, the climate plan is one thing. But as soon as you go over into the energy section of the, of the CPC plan, you see support for un bridled oil and gas expansion. So we have, they want to build another pipeline. They want to build the Northern uh, Gateway Pipeline. Uh, they want to uh, 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 build out LNG facilities and export facilities. They want to expand oil production. Now look, oil production is already forecast to go up 900,000 barrels a day between now and 2030. On top of that already, now I don't know how you square th the biggest uh, GHG emitting industry and expansion of that industry with lowering emissions and hitting 2030 tar targets. I, uh, have you got any ideas on how that might work? I don't think it can be done. I mean, the real challenge, there's two challenges for Canada with the oil and gas industry. The first is the emissions within Canada for extracting that oil and gas. It's the single largest contributor to our national greenhouse gas emissions. So the more we produce, unless magic happens and everybody's counting on CCS suddenly becoming affordable. Well, it hasn't in the last 15 years. It's still not commercially viable at this scale. Then we then when we increase production, our emissions go up. But the biggest challenge for Canada's industry is global ambition on climate change because as the world is serious about reducing emissions, they will buy less oil. And our lower quality oil and more expensive to produce oil is especially vulnerable. And I don't see the Conservatives taking on that challenge. In fact, they talk about shortages of, of um shortages of workers to serve the energy industry rather than planning for a just transition for those workers. That will happen when our, the countries to which we export reduce our consumption. And we are seeing that from the US right now, which is right now the only market to which we are exporting 80% of our production. The Biden administration wants to zero out sale of new um, gas powered vehicles in 2035. Um, that is a very strong signal that our export markets are in trouble. Um, and I, I don't see the Conservatives taking that seriously in any way. Right. I mean, you know, the data says that the gasoline and, and diesel sales have already peaked in North America and are expected to, to go down. I mean, it's only in Asia that you're going to see an expansion. But let's talk about the po politics of, of that, because, you know, I've reported on the oil and gas industry for years and years now, and I pay attention to what uh, the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers says, and the, uh, you know, the cap, 
And they just put out an election platform as they do uh, regularly when there's an election. And I can't, it looks to me like CAP wrote the oil and gas section of the CPC platform. That's pretty much what it looks, and CAP has said, it is perfectly consistent to think about increasing the production of hydrocarbons in Canada while and still meeting Canada's, uh, they don't say how that's gonna happen. They just say that it can happen. And you can see it obviously it reflected in the CPC platform. Political scientist, your take on that. Um, well, I think for a very long time, we have had these two very separate conversations. One about acting on climate change, um, focus on our own emissions and the other is about the oil and gas industry, primarily exports. And we haven't connected the dots between the two, but that will become increasingly difficult over time. Politically, we've been able to keep them as separate conversations. As global ambition increases, the prospect of um, declining global markets for our exports becomes real, the need to plan becomes real, but the Conservatives have a base in Alberta and Saskatchewan. They also are the party that has attracted the climate change deniers disproportionately. So they are continuing to have that separate conversation, even as they have you know, tried to appeal to the 905 suburban voters in Ontario, to voters in Quebec by saying, look, we're doing something on climate change. At the same time, they're saying, don't worry, the oil and gas industry is gonna expand and we'll change the criminal code. Um, to add a new offense for people who block pipelines. Um, so, I mean, the conservatives are playing to their base at the same time as they're trying to um, appeal to suburban voters who are more concerned about climate change. And I think it's very difficult for them to credibly do both at the same time. Now, is it not the case in elections, uh, Catherine, that parties do this all the time? I mean, they have to, they have to appeal to their base they have to broaden their uh, in order to make get a, a majority and get enough votes and, and seats to get a majority. They also have to appeal to uh, to voters outside of their base. So this is not an uncommon uh, practice by parties in election. But this on this issue, it, it, they it seems to be a disconnect, a, a much bigger disconnect than the, than the other parties. Well, and that's because there's a bigger gap between the conservatives' base and action on climate change. Um, a majority of voters in Alberta and Saskatchewan, where the Conservatives do extremely well, still doubt that climate change is caused by human activity. Um, we saw that at the Conservatives' convention. They, their, their core base are strong supporters of the oil and gas industry, which produces a product that causes climate change used as intended. So. The challenge for them is much greater than the other parties to try square that circle, and I don't think they've done it yet. Catherine, thank you very much for your insights. Really appreciate this. You're very welcome.